So thank you very much, everybody, for being here, particularly those who are coming from very far. We're really happy, Corinne and I, and Guido in a minute, to welcome you to this conference, Gendering Platforms, Law, Regulations, and Alternatives. The first thing I'm going to do is give the floor to Guido, with whom I organized the call for paper, and I'll let you know about it uh, in a minute. Uh, and then Corinne and I will, uh, will tell you a bit more about this day and its organization and about all the wonderful things <laughs> we're going to hear today and the coherence behind this project. So first of all, I leave the floor to Guido and uh, I'll just put this down so that you can see him. Here we go, he appears. So Guido, we can hear you, I think. So here you go. Yes, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Corinne. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry not to be with you. I had a small accident a few time ago. I'm going to heal, but I wasn't able to travel these days. So I give my small presentation, not a presentation, just to say hi to all of you uh, at distance. Uh, just to explain the, the framework we are discussing, within which we are discussing today, because the, the cost action key will, it stands for Platform Work Inclusion Living Lab. And what the main aim we are pursuing is to incorporate an intersectional feminist approach to the platform work issues. Within that, we, uh, together with Tania Jacobi and um, with, with, uh, also with Claire and Maurizio Pirone, we uh, co-lead the VG4, which is the one devoted to uh, collective action and policy and regulation. So it is within this framework that we organize this part of the conference and uh, the, especially this call for paper we made uh, to, in order to gather papers and to public a special issue that, as uh, Claire uh, mentioned before, will be uh, published on a very well reputed uh, journal, an Italian journal published in English, Law and Labor Issues. Um, the idea uh, within the, the, the VG4 is to map collective action strategies and regulatory and policy proposals. And the reason to do that is to uh, give voice to ex excluded collectives, to co-create, not just to uh, top down, but to co-create initiatives and proposals, and also to test policy guidelines and proposals in order to gather different policy initiatives. So what we are doing today in the perspective of VG, VG4, Corinne uh, will say uh, something on the, the, the other part of the conference related to the work of VG2, is to uh, map the main regulatory issues that we have with regard to platform work uh, from a gender intersectional perspective. And these uh, are just uh, other two words uh, before leaving the floor to my colleagues, uh, just to say that uh, there will be another step very soon, which is to uh, uh, map and to gather all the policy initiatives in this regard. And we, we aim at uh, having another call related to this other part. Uh, and again, the, the main uh, aspect that we will take into consideration is the uh, intersectional feminist approach to platform work. So more to come. Uh, we have this conference today. I'm glad to stay with you even at distance and to listen to the uh, many talks we will have during the day. Again, uh, thank you, everybody. Hope to see you soon in uh, the next event. And have a nice day. I leave the floor to, I think, Claire again or Corinne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guido. <laughs> thank you very much. And having understood the general framework of the action, I think I will just mention that we have here the chair of uh, the action, Mayo, uh, who's here, <laughs> and so with whom all of this would not have been possible, and uh, also Branca, the vice chair, who's probably with us online, 
not sure. But anyway, uh, so again, with whom the, all this would not have been possible. And so we want to thank them very much because um, we're very happy to be here today. So what are we going to talk about today? As I said, law, regulations and alternatives in order to focus on this weird subject that is gendering platforms. And in order to understand these two words, I think it's worth spending a little bit of time on each of them in order to try and see what we can do with this. And actually, when you start thinking about it, you realize that both these words have so many meanings that it is going to be pretty tricky. So I'll start with gendering, and here I probably need to apologize because there are so many ways to start with that. I've only put two little definitions. I've chosen here to go from the French approach, um, starting obviously with actually uh, an American point of view because the, the even notion of gender uh, didn't come from France, but I, I, I decided to start with that. Uh, this is just a drop in the ocean. So like, <laughs> feel, uh, don't feel constrained by this definition. But I felt it was very important at the beginning of the day to give a sense of the direction we were going towards. So gendering or gender as a synonymous of social sex. It's the idea that beyond biological sex, there is this social attitude, this social meaning, this social understanding of sex, uh, which is going to have an impact on people's relationship, on society, on the organization of society. And as a result, we can go towards a second meaning, which is, and I've written it here, the means by which power and its principal weapon, the law, seizes, classifies, and disciplines individuals. You'll see that this definition that I've chosen, I've chosen it on purpose because I'm a legal scholar myself, and so it was useful for the approach we took in the special issue that we've coordinated to have some sort of legal approach. But again, I'm completely aware that there are many different ways of approaching this matter. So um, this is the idea. We've tried to identify the extent to which there could be a gendering of platforms. And obviously, the next term is platforms. So here I must specify that when we're talking about platforms, again, in the special issue, uh, we've chosen to focus on, these, on platform work, actually. Uh, and so to look at digital platforms, in, in very simple words, which use the internet and geolocation. So how these internet platforms, digital platforms, will lead to a new form, or not so new, form of work. And so we have a definition which has been provided by the European Council and which has been used many, many times and actually even again in the new uh, directive on platform work. And platform work is defined, and I've put the definition here, as a form of employment in which organizations or individuals use an online platform to access other organizations or individuals to solve specific problems or to provide specific services in exchange for payment. So pretty much, it's a useless definition, let's be honest. The only thing which matters here is that something will be provided in exchange for payment. And that's what is going to be important in order for us to determine that there is work. So once we've said that, we've identified gender, gendering, we've identified platforms and platform work, and obviously I'll be happy to answer questions if there are any, uh, we can start wondering the extent to which law and regulations on the one hand and alternatives in the other hand can be found. And so I'll focus on the first aspect and then uh, Corinne will talk about the next one. Law and regulations, um, the point here was and remains 
to examine existing legal frameworks through a gender lens and to um, think about it in order to propose normative reinterpretations that address gender-specific challenges in platform work. So yes, this is a very small point, and it looks like it might be very uninteresting because it's so small that it doesn't concern anybody, but the truth is that those two subjects intersect and actually make it a real social, societal problem because uh, what we're going to discover when we start thinking about the organization, the policies, the regulations, and the laws behind platforms and behind gender, we realize that actually we're talking about the whole goal of society. So what are we going to look at? And this is a call for you to come to room 100 afterwards, which is right below this amphitheater. <laughs> uh, we're going to see uh, how in many different countries, and we were really really happy, Guido and I, to receive so many answers from so many countries uh, to see that everywhere in the world this is an actual problem, this is an actual issue, and everybody tackles it. So we got answers from China, India, Brazil, uh, the whole European Union, the United States, uh, and so you see that all around the world the question of platforms is relevant and the question of gender is relevant. So how do, have they been put together? And you'll see, and you can see in the program, that uh, we'll have very different, almost anecdotes, like very different stories, which each pinpoints this issue. Uh, for instance, we'll have the story of yoga teachers in Berlin who can come together to try and create a different platform or organize within a platform in order to improve their rights. We'll have the story of abortion. Abortion in the United States for, I mean, I'm sure you are aware that things changed quite a bit just because of one case rendered by the Supreme Court in the United States and how this has impacted again platforms and abortion platforms or like in fact the access to an abortion pill uh, in the United States that's uh, that's the kind of story we can uh, come across this is the story of women crowd workers in the United Kingdom fighting for their rights um, etc I could go on and on uh, I think it's extremely interesting to see that in, a, in all these cases, in different states, in the European Union, we'll talk about the directive, the new directive on platform work, at international level also, with the International Labour Organization, the question is raised and the question is seen, and people, not only women, are trying to answer it. And at different levels, we'll see that uh, individuals, workers, providers, platforms, uh, regulators, trade unions, and uh, leaders or political persons are responding to these issues in more or less innovative ways. And, uh, and we try to move forward and we try to assess these regulations and see the extent to which uh, it takes us somewhere. But there is another uh, dimension to this. And exactly, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. So we have people coming from all these countries. So again, please come to room 100, <laughs> as well as remaining with Corinne. Hopefully, we'll have people in both rooms. But anyway, I leave the floor to Corinne, who's going to tell you more about alternatives. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so I'm Corinne verchet chaptal I'm professor of organizational studies at the University Sorbonne Paris Nord, that is a member of the Campus Condorcet. 
I'm really, really happy to welcome you to, to the PWIL conference uh, in, the confer in this conference center of this campus. Uh, this campus brings together the largest humanities and social sciences laboratories in the Ile-de-France region. I'm also pleased to welcome you to Aubervilliers, a suburb that has welcomed many, many waves of immigration to France. It's one of the poorest suburbs, but it's very rich in collective citizen initiatives and solidarity economy. So we are certainly on the good place uh, to talk about alternative. Even so, we probably a little too confined to this campus. Uh, to introduce the creation of alternatives, I would like to explain our rationale for linking them uh, to uh, law and regulation. So the, ub the uberization of the economy because of its capacity to increase the commodification of the world encourages the counter movement to counterbalance the action of the dominant players in digital capitalism and to protect society. So in Europe and elsewhere, we are witnessing actions of resistance by public institutions, courts and legislators, as you said, Claire. Uh, these actions are aimed at creating regulatory mecha mechanisms to control and embed platforms. With, very, <laughs> with varying degrees of success. Uh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, so uh, this uh, dialectic is characteristic of the double movement highlighted by Karl Polanyi in, in his book, The Great Transformation. But these attempts at regulation by macro institutions are not only basis for are not the only basis for a counter movement. The counter movement it's not just defensive; it can also be offensive. It can it can, it can take the form of local initiatives rooted in their territory, in their context, and that are likely to promote an embeddedness of the economy or re-embeddedness of digital economy. On the ground, in different places around the world, alternative models of platform are emerging. They are quite different from the centralized and extractive functioning of oligopolistic platform and from the dynamics of exclusion, disintegration of work and social protection that the latter of, uh, often generate. These alternatives platform are the barriers of social innovation aimed at expanding cooperation and solidarity through new digital tools. These platforms represent an offensive reaction to the expansion of the phenomenon of commodification. They are alternatives because they refuse to replicate or compete with the form of the dominant economy. It is these two dimensions of the counter movement, defensive versus offensive, macro versus micro, that we want to highlight with Claire and Guido in this conference to help to foster alternative scenarios in the frame of platform economy. That's why we have brought together the, the perspectives of the two work, PWIL working group, working group four <laughs> and two. Um, so, but uh, the effects of counter movement are far from certain. They mainly depend on the societal forces involved and the orientation of the political elites and this actor's ability to unite around a counter project. In markets where network effects tend to produce winner takes all phenomena, the emergence of alternatives most often with insufficient financial investment is really tricky. In the face of adversity, alternative platforms 
are, experiment, uh, are experimenting with method of operation based on several current, the digital common and free software, or the cooperative tradition. A number of research studies on alternative platform, including, including ones that we conducted ourselves in France, have shown that their projects give rise to practical experiments with original model. Those models that are not simply ethical copy taste of the dominant capitalist platform, they lead to a real shift in the service offer in the sector involved. What we have found is that the strategy of the platform is not, is not so much aimed at adapting dominant models by limiting their negative externality, but rather at inventing new model. Uh, <laughs> I have a few minutes, yes? So, <laughs> so we decided uh, in our research uh, to qualify uh, this platform, the platform study as substantive, in line with the view of economy developed by Karl Polanyi. The substantive view of economy focuses on relation between individual and with the natural environment on which they depend for the livelihood. Livelihood, sorry. It integrates these interdependencies as cost, cost constituting economic activity, which embraces a relational perspective and aims to create social ties as much as goods. Some of these alternative platforms have feminist perspective. The gender dimension is present in alternative in South America and Southern Europe, such as Spain, for instance. And we are very lucky to have several representatives of this platform with us today. So thank you especially to Raphael Groman and Mayo Foster Moel for putting me in touch with them. And thank you, Aline, Elena, Mariazza, Cecilia, Nouria, Ori, Emma, for taking time to come here and exchange with us of your experience, your hopes, your difficulty, your need in making this concrete utopia as reality. So we will, uh, sorry, we will, it's the reason why I think uh, uh, I, I'm trying to explain to you why we have constructed two parallel sessions. First one, reinterpreting law and regulation, as Claire said, and uh, the session uh, will be uh, in the room uh, 100 on the ground floor, and we will have parallel session uh, to explore alternative here. Uh, in this uh, auditorium. Uh, it's a pity to uh, be obliged to have the session in parallel, but it's organizing a uh, constraint. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, everything is recorded. If everybody, is, uh, everybody agrees with that, I hope so. Sorry, I, don't, I didn't ask you before. <laughs> And um, we will uh, finish with the uh, logistic dimensions. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> yes, if you, if you want, but you are more. OK. Uh, so just on the logistic points, uh, two more things to say. For those who are part of the cost action, please remember to sign the attendance sheets. I know we're extremely annoying with that, but as you might know, this is a condition for your reimbursement, so do not forget, as this uh, would really be an issue afterwards. The second thing to remember is that you have to make your claim on the website, however difficult it is within two weeks after the event. So again, do not forget that because again, uh, th you would not be reimbursed. Uh, last thing for those who want, you can join the P will cost action. And so I'm giving you here the link, uh, the list of the link of the action first, if you want to have a look at it. 
And second, if you are interested in being part, uh, you can visit the How to Join page. And again, the link is here. And if you have questions, there is uh, an email address as well. And this is it. So thank you very much. Have a lovely day. And just why so uh, you're welcome also the student epoch, the epoch student uh, epoch is a, um, uh, Erasmus uh, master. So those students will be with us uh, in the next session and participate to the next session. So thank you to the students. So right now you can have a little coffee and in 15 minutes, in 15 minutes we'll start. So one session will be here and the other session will be right below in room 100. Okay, we are starting. Uh, so for this session, uh, I'm very happy to welcome... Um, uh, as I said, uh, EPOC students. So I will let the floor to David Flashy to present uh, briefly this, uh, this uh, very uh, famous uh, master. Th thank you. It's fine. Thank you very much, Corinne. Thank you for the invitation, for the invi my invitation and the invitation of all the students. Uh, just to introduce the program to those who, who don't know the program, it's an Erasmus Mundus Joint Master. Erasmus Mundus is a really incredible program of the European Union aiming to gather different universities from in Europe, but also beyond Europe, to create an integrated master's program and on original topics, on original approaches, and then to attract students with scholarships, with, uh, with lots of means available, to attract students from all around the world, not only, uh, not only the EU. And, and in this cohort of 46 students, we have 24 nationalities, which is a, which is a, a great thing. Uh, EPOG stands for Economic Policies for the Global Transition or Global Bifurcation. It will change a little bit. And uh, it's based on three different majors. Uh, uh, one is on more industrial economics, uh, knowledge, innovation. Another one on macroeconomics and finance. And the third one on development. Uh, and one of the originality of this program, first is being an institutionalist, uh, I mean, teaching institutionalist economics, uh, heterodox economics. And, um, and uh, it's also, I mean, it's really an approach which aims to be open also to the other social sciences. And it's, it's really important for us. It's not true for all the economists in general. It's true for us. And, um, and we also want the students of these three different streams, which are very different streams, to work also together and to, to, to have a common culture at the end of the program. And one part of the, the exercise to get this common culture is to discuss seminars and I'm really happy that, that we have been invited here for this, uh, for this conference and the students will have 15 minutes together, four of them are here, to discuss uh, uh, the presentation. And I'm also very happy because it's years then that students are asking more about gender issues and, and it's a very good opportunity for, for us to offer uh, uh, these, uh, these, these approaches. So thank you very much, Corinne. Thanks to the COST project and all the organizers. You can tell thanks to Mayo Foster Moel for <laughs> <laughs> I thank him. <laughs> thank you, David. So for this session, uh, I'm happy to welcome um, uh, Raphael. Roman, uh, Raphael, if you want to go with <laughs> us. <laughs> And and uh, and Firuze. Uh, so Rafael uh, is uh, assistant professor of media studies at the University of uh, Toronto, and leader of a lot of very interesting research projects. I'll let you to present because Rafael do many things, <laughs> really. So. <laughs> Okay, I can talk here. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you are well. Thank you, Mayo, Cohen, uh, and everybody from PWU to for having me, for having us, especially from Latin America. 
we have some like Latin American too uh, today uh, here. And um, I'd like to share with you some notes from um, some of my field, especially uh, a research we have together with organizations in Brazil and in Argentina called Worker on Intersectional Platforms. It's uh, a research we conduct together with Senoritas Courier from Brazil, uh, Maria Lab from Brazil, um, Homeless Worker Movement is the technology division with Brazil, uh, FACTIC, the Federation of Tech Co-ops in Argentina, Alternativa Laboral Trans or Alt Co-op in, in Argentina, and Central Salta in, from Argentina. And we are asking a question, what is a uh, worker on platform from intersectional perspective? And I'll share some notes also from the book I'm trying to write, because uh, we academics are also workers and we have chairs who say, okay, you have to write a book. And, and for me, it was difficult because, you know, the type of research we do, sometimes this not fits in a book who will be published five years after. And uh, this is uh, also uh, a challenge. So I'll, I will share with you some notes. The first one is related to an uh, old, old word called praxis. One of the things I realized when attending this, this kind of event is a kind of separation between theorization or theorists or scholars and practitioners. But who are practitioners or who are the theorizations of it or who, are, who theorize about what? Um, I have like one example. There's uh, a person called Nuria Soto from Mensacas in Barcelona who wrote a book called Riders on the Storm. I really like this title actually. Uh, and writing about the reality of delivery workers in uh, a delivery co-op in Barcelona. And she finished the book talking about how sometimes academics would like to have cooperatives as the sherry uh, on the top of the cake for the future of work. For in, in how sometimes academics refuse to ask about diffi difficulties or challenges in order to sometimes we're romanticizing some of these alternatives. So it's important to have this dialectical approach in order to recognize both um, like uh, alternatives or what this means alternatives, but also especially considering um, the contradictions the out of place or incomplete process we are facing in our everyday work. And beyond that, um, this division between practitioners or in, in scholars uh, blur the lines of uh, old, old uh, differentiation uh, about manual labor and intellectual labor. Sometimes I, I, I feel like, especially in a department of arts, culture, and media, uh, when we talk about creative workers, it's also about like artists and like all workers are creative in, in their own way. And the separation between intellectual labor and manual labor have been like reproducing. And we academics are also workers, sometimes facing precarious situations. So this kind of sometimes like often <laughs> live in precarious situations uh, uh, in, in academia as well. Uh, especially from minoritized groups. So this kind of positionality or research ethics or part of our research methods for me is the foundations of our, of our discussions. Um, and, and this for me is part of this, this conversation. I'm trying to write a book about, and this is the second note, about the learning process or how workers are trying and trying and learning and failing and learning again uh, how to govern technologies. Uh, because it's not, there's not no a manual to do it. Say, okay, you have to do in that, that way and you will achieve success. And actually what I, I would try to ask is exactly questioning 
all this vocabulary about best practices or ideal governance or, or sharing uh, ideals or, or something like that or sharing um, what is exactly success. I discovered that Silicon Valley launched a failure institute in order to venture capitalists sharing with each other their failures. And with that reappropriation, this notion of from Samuel Beckett, failing more, failing better, failing faster. So they can share with, it, which, with each other. So I failed with this startup, but I, I am funding another one and I will achieve the success. But this is the appropriation of what success is and failure is from a capitalist perspective. How to understand this when people don't have resources to fund another uh, initiative? They are their lives. Or sometimes they faced the failure since the beginning uh, especially with gender and race and class market in, in, in their lives. So how to understand this kind of learning process? In the first time I researched with a cooperative in Argentina, seven years ago, uh, in a newspaper called Tiempo Argentino, it's a worker recovered uh, a, a journal, a newspaper there in, in Buenos Aires. Um, a journalist there who nowadays is the president of the co-op, in the beginning of interview I, I was trying to do with her, she said to me, Rafael, every day there's a new journalist or a new researcher coming to us saying, you are amazing, you are the future of work, uh, and you are warriors. And Rafael, I have to say to you, please don't romanticize us. We are not warriors. We are not the future of work. We are trying to survive in our own terms. And we are trying to learn how to do it in our own way. But this is not exactly uh, uh, a way or a manual to do it. And I, I met this person again now in my last travel to Argentina. And I said to her that, this will be one of the key <laughs> parts or as a method part for like research uh, and, and the research path. And this is difficult sometimes to not fail in, in, in like we researchers falling on, okay, cooperatives will not be, uh, I have Marxist friends who say, okay, Rafael, don't lose your time with cooperative because this is not a revolution. Or others who, who, who said, um, oh, this is the best one. So there's a lot of out of place, incomplete or contradictions ways to understand it in this kind of flavor of bittersweet in relation to cooperatives or in relation to working on initiatives. Uh, and it's not, uh, and I discover in queer studies a notion called queer failure. Because uh, in queer studies, uh, this notion of queer failure reminds us that queer people don't fall on normal or what is considered normal in relation to gender. And this does not fit with what is considered success in a traditional way. So we have also to understand our cooperatives, our worker on initiatives, especially uh, gender-red racialized uh, from majority of the world initiatives, considered there as a kind of monsters as well. We do not fit with the parameters or the measures or the metrics of other people considering our capitalists uh, matrix you consider it as success. So uh, they are trying. And this means also challenges, economic challenges in a market dominated by bumping of, uh, dumping of platforms, a lot of lobbying, uh, 
Aline Oz from Senoritas is here to, to say I'm not a liar, but the main delivery platform in Brazil, iFood, already sent spies to some of our conferences on cooperativism and to say, okay, we want to be part of this group as well. We have governance challenges as well. How to maintain people there and how to maintain the political and economic value of the, the cooperative or initiative uh, between the collective, or how to build collectivities is not easy. All these challenges are old challenges, actually. Institutional challenges in relation to law, local laws in, in different um, countries and in regions of the world, and also technological challenges, because sometimes the app does not work as well, uh, or sometimes uh, you, you face some technological challenges to design or build that technology considering their needs. Because sometimes we, we don't want to be techno-solutionism as well. So it's not about like technology solving the problem or technology solving the world. So this is another thing. And maybe the problem is to call all these initiatives as platforms as well. Because we need to go beyond platforms. We need to go beyond also cooperativism in order to recognize in different institutionalities or different types of collectivities around the world, especially those who consider it more in informal ways. So these are these kind of challenges. And I'm here also to start a conversation from a Latin American perspective of this kind of situations. Uh, later, uh, some of my colleagues will talk about uh, other layers on, on it, but just to start in how Latin America has a long, long history of solidarity economy, like uh, Catalonia region also. Uh, and Latin America has a long, long history of so-called alternative technologies as well. So when we are talking about solidarity economy in Latin America, especially, but not only, we are talking not only about creating business or creating organizations, but also with political purposes. There's something that I learned in Argentina as well, that the cooperatives who who can survive uh, through, throughout the time are cooperatives born through struggle and or crisis. And how this is a kind of political struggle who also is a strength of the, these initiatives. Um, and solidarity economy is a long, long tradition in a cultural way uh, and sometimes losing between generations as well. Som and sometimes young people now are recovering this kind of notion because people are not circulating at all this kind of uh, initiatives B between like universities. You don't have like a course on in each discipline on cooperative alternatives for like media studies or something in our own field. Um, and Latin America has a lot of pioneering technological projects, especially in the 70s, like Cyber Scene in Chile, who was um, a, a trying of a Chilean government to combine socialism and cybernetics in order to put democratic planning through a technological development way. And this was erased by the, the, the coup of state there in the 70s. This is well documented in a book written by Eden Medina called Cybernetic Revolutionaries, which after Evgeny Morozov um, produced a do, um, podcast called The Santiago Boys. Also, there is another Brazilian researcher called Rodrigo Oshigami, who wrote an, an article called Informatics of Oppressed. And she talked about uh, algorithms in Cuba 
based on the notion of popular librarian. And this algorithm created by a woman librarian in Cuba was not recognized in Wikipedia until two years ago, or three years ago. This was created in the 70s. Maria Teresa Freire de Andrade was a librarian who created an algorithm based on popular notions of education, of librarian, of ways of archiving, who is, which is one of the pioneer ways to fight algorithms of oppression. And this kind of algorithm produced in Cuba was different than the US model or the Russian model. After I can share with you this article. So we have a lot of erased or invisible histories in our, in our past histories, actually. We have to uh, inspire from these past struggles as well, because some of the, the challenges are similar than nowadays. We have also to recognize uh, the importance of African or the African diaspora uh, cooperativism, especially by black women or the epistemologies of black women. Uh, and here I quote a colleague of mine called Caroline Hussein, who just res recently launched a book called The Banker Ladies. And she talked about black women or racialized women from Africa diaspora creating uh, uh, rotating in credit cooperatives. And this was not recognized sometimes for even cooperative scholars or even states, because sometimes they are informal in institutional ways as well. So Carolina Hussein argued for um, a concept called var var varieties of cooperativism. If we have varieties of capitalism, we also have varieties of cooperativism. We don't want to fit uh, cooperativism in only one model because there is not one unique model, but you have like differences and diversities around that. Um, the four, fourth note I would like to share with you is also is stressing this notion who became so popular around the world called platform cooperativism as well. Um, a lot of times in, in a lot of articles I wrote, I stress that maybe in Latin America, this notion does not fit so well because sometimes there's, we are not platforms or we are not cooperatives and so on. And it was interesting because a lot of other scholars and a lot of other cooperatives or collectives as well were trying to create other names to name this phenomenon. So I myself uh, coined this as like worker on technologies or something. Uh, another colleague of mine, Daniel Santini, coined this as Solidarity Economy 2.0. Uh, another scholar called Rafael Zanata wrote about uh, solidarity platformization. And we have a good discussion between workers, uh, workers from academia, workers from delivery sector, workers from tech, uh, tech sector, and, and so on and so on, in order to recover this past history of Latin America and try to frame this as a digital solidarity economies, in plural. Recognizing that when we're talking about digital solidarity economies, we are talking both in relation to the digital transformation of the traditional solidarity economy, even in rural areas, for instance, in, in Brazil or other countries, uh, and how the digital technologies can be present in the traditional solidarity economy, but also fighting for digital economies with more solidarity is a core issue in a lot of sectors, and not only uh, in, in delivery or ride hailing, but what if platformization of labor affects all sectors, we have to think about this kind of uh, other approaches uh, or self-manager approach in all sectors as well. Uh, so this is a big challenge. 
Um, we wrote uh, Aline, uh, two colleagues from Homeless Worker Movement, and uh, Daniel Santini from Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Brazil. We wrote an article together um, in a book review in relation to last Trevor Show's book called On This, and saying how it's difficult to, um, how sometimes people who study in some places consider them themselves as a global scholar. And sometimes this is a kind of fraud. How we can be like a global scholar and rooted in all these kind of communities. And, and this is really a complicated issue because we have like situate knowledge. We can like, I, I can travel to here to Paris to do some interviews, but it's different than like my knowledge in, in Brazil, for instance. Um, and, and we reivindicate in this book review uh, in the more like diverse forms to understand uh, our digital solidarity economies approach or more pluralistic approaches to, to it. Um, and also this means understanding intersectionality in our project worker on intersectional platforms. We are trying to understand exactly what means considering this kind of initiative from intersectional platforms? We did a literature review on intersectionality and platform economy, and we learned that most of articles on intersectionality and platform economy are only based on gender. But what is exactly intersectionality there? And we know that intersectionality is a concept coined by black feminist scholars centering race as one of the, the main points there. And so sometimes in intersectionality became some kind of umbrella and sometimes erasure or race and erasure in class sometimes as well. So how to connect exactly these points is an is a, a, a important issue we are framing this project. Even like in Brazil and Argentina, for instance, the race issue is different because the contexts are, are also different in these uh, two countries. So um, what we are trying to, to understand is not only gender, race, and class as metrics of oppressions, like Patricia Hill Collins uh, said before, but so how we can fight back and reimagining other worlds from these uh, perspectives as well. And this is so difficult to reimagine a new world when you are building or living in this world we are living and trying to survive in our everyday practices. Uh, this is one of the challenges or how to think about intersectionality in work organization and also in the Techno technological design. We are talking a lot about in this project about care as a core value for both work organization then in design of technologies. We are talking a lot about a slogan created by an organization based in Spain called Disco.coop and they talk about care before code. And care before code means we have to be careful before to create new technologies. Technologies are ancestral and not all technologies should exist. We have a lot of like uh, uh, potential harmful technologies being created at all. So we have to be careful before to create technologies. But also putting care as a core value while coding or while creating technologies as well. And care as a collective issue within the work organization as well. And also we are starting and trying and learning as well, me and, and all the, this research team, uh, especially this year, what can, um, uh, how to put queer and trans lens to understand all this intersectionality or what is exactly queer about queering 
platform, so querying technology, querying work organization. I don't have this answer right now, uh, but we we start from the questions or how it can be think like understanding otherwise or in different ways than the way we are building uh, nowadays. We hope to launch a collective report from this research next year with like trying to respond to some of these questions. But I have to say that is there is some challenges also when imagining when we are talking together in this in this project and we are trying to imagine okay how to think about other kinds of uh, technologies for is difficult because our our uh, first approach is try to imitate the, the current technologies or the current way of living. It's sometimes it's difficult to think about these prefigurative models as well. And I'm putting in this, it's difficult to imagine. Uh, Ruha Benjamin, uh, a black feminist scholar from the US, uh, published recently a book called Imagination, a Manifesto. And she said exactly that way. We have to radically reimagine the world, and this is a political, um, uh, political uh, framework. Or there's a political issue, and we ha we have a crisis of imagination in this world, especially from an anti-capitalist intersectional perspective, and and not only like trying to. Uh, um, maintain the world we are living in, but how to repurpose or even refuse some of these things we are living in nowadays. For me, this is one of the main challenges. And also the role of state. Uh, the research we have until now, not only by me, but a lot of researchers, Denise Kasparian, for instance, is here, and, and a lot of uh, Greg De Piotr is also here from Canada, and we have a lot of research saying, okay, these initiatives need um, public policies uh, for maintaining and fostering and, and accelerating these initiatives. We have, unfortunately, few, few examples of public policies in the sector. One of them is from Barcelona, the Match Impulse, Impulse uh, uh, Initiative, which, which propose is exactly promote the platformization of solidarity economy from a gender perspective. And now in, in Brazil, we are trying to pressure the government, uh, <laughs> sending emails and calling them every day uh, in order to push for a national policy on platform co-op or we, we are preferring to say there's a digital solidarity economy and uh, we launch a book with them is with our research group plus Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and the Ministry of Labor in Brazil is a book unfortunately only in Portuguese called digital solidarity economy and this is a Illustrated guide, not exactly guide or unguide, <laughs> um, in order to train workers uh, about this issue. Because there's a lot of information and it's difficult to circulate the word, or to spread the word, especially in this platformization uh, uh, context. Um, we'll see if we will have like an English and Spanish translation in the next few uh, months. But what was interesting here, um, I can detail more how was this articulation, but I can say to you that uh, we wrote this together and sometimes, I don't know if the government read everything we, we write, but we are pressuring the government in a, in a, in a publication by the government. So <laughs> we finished the book saying the Brazilian government should do this kind of policies. And I don't know if someone did not review that, but now we have a way where you are promising this. <laughs> and we recognize in the, in the, in the end of this, this document, a kind of uh, some policies we need in order to foster 
public policies for uh, digital solidarity economy in Brazil. And some of these challenges or some of these policies, one is relation to literacy and communication. Because you know, like how many people knows a co-op, a cooperative from your discipline or from your sector? Uh, when I ask my media students, how many media co-ops do you know? No one. So this is an issue we have to face in order to circulate it, to spread the word. Um, the second one is about um, infrastructure. And for me, this is one of the core issues of it. Because we don't want to replicate one Uber for each city in each country. It's not about that. Uh, but the state can offer some public digital infrastructure or digital public infrastructures in order to offer some of the the result, especially for federations, especially for federated networks in a country in a regional level or something. Um, also, we are talking about like funding exactly because sometimes there's a, or m most of times there's a lack of funding by initiatives as well. Uh, we are talking about incubation. In Brazil, maybe this will be a good news for us. Uh, there will be a launch or relaunch of um, public policies for incubators focused on digital solidarity economies in many sectors. And they selected some of sectors who, whose the Brazilian government considered essentials are delivery and ride hailing, care, uh, technology, and rural areas or familiar agriculture or something. And technology co of fostering technology cooperatives is also a core in the strategic issue because only fostering tech co-ops, you also will provide services in order to promote intercooperation between more sectoral uh, co-ops and these tech co-ops and promoting a more uh, sustainable um, environment in this situation. So we are trying to pressure the government. Two years ago, uh, one of the delivery workers from Senoritas sent uh, a manifesto written by us to Lula. We have a photo with, uh, uh, between Senoritas delivery worker and Lula. And now we are using this to pressure the government and, and every day. Hope, let's see in the next few months or years if we will get success, but there's a lot of contradictions, especially in a government um, also shaped by uh, white male uh, saying like we are right and, and you workers will not teach to us anything. And, and sometimes there are a lot of difficulties dealing with this kind of behavior as well. Um, and to finish my, my presentation, there's a lot of discussions nowadays around sovereignty, especially here in, in Europe. And we know that like some of these discussions are around sovereignty, they can be co-opted by platforms as well. Like last year, Amazon, Google and Microsoft launched digital sovereign programs to sell sovereignty as service uh, to governments who want to be sovereign. We know how this discursive approach works. So we have to be careful about which kind of sovereignty we are talking about. Because when a lot of people are talking the same buzzwords and they are from different political backgrounds, you have to be careful what digital sovereignty can mean for us in this context. Or even autonomy. We're talking about autonomy and sovereignty as well. And uh, I'd like to quote uh, the homeless worker movement in Brazil is a huge one of the strongest social movements in, in Latin America in urban scenarios and they are fighting for housing. But they also have um, technology division. And they are organizing tech workers, but they are also creating technologies for homeless workers. And they wrote um, a report last year called Homeless Worker Movement and Digital Sovereignty. This is available in English and Portuguese. 
and they are arguing for a digital sovereignty from a popular perspective and how workers can take control over data, AI platforms and so on. And it's not only about creating our own organizations, but creating a more broader concept of it. I know the, the Federation of Tech Co-ops in Argentina is also thinking of digital sovereignty as a core aspect beyond the organizational level. And this is also an ongoing conversation. This is not like uh, uh, a playbook or how to play this, this, this issue. And finishing, finishing my, my presentation, uh, with all this scenario, we are seeing a lot of universities now, like I'm Brazilian and located now in North America. In my own university, I'm seeing a lot of discussions around um, sustainable development goals. Oh, we at university need to promote decent work. We would like to decolonize in our curriculum, decolonize in our universities. And in our project, we said, okay, let's see if our universities are really committed with it. Uh, and we will launch this afternoon in person, a campaign led by Art Cooperative and FACTIC in Argentina in our worker on intersectional platforms. And it's a campaign called Hire a Co-op. Uh, and the slogan is, don't trust big tech, hire a co-op. And uh, this is directed especially to universities in the Global North who is, is promising to be aware of these situations in order to uh, hire tech co-ops uh, for uh, tech services in their research projects, like alternatives for like Google Drive or whatever. And, and we have an Instagram as well if you like to follow hire a co-op. And we will we start this campaign online and in campus around universities in the next few months. So please follow us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rafael. Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, now I'm very happy to welcome uh, Firuze Choco Valley. And uh, Firuze is a feminist sociologist and journalist from Puerto Rico. And uh, uh, she wrote a book, uh, In Defense of Solidarity and Pleasure. And uh, when I uh, read it, I find um, the point to add pleasure to solidarity as a crucial dimension of alternative, very, very inspiring. So please. <laughs> This one? No. no. Not this one. <laughs> you saw it earlier, it was there. Yes. This one. This one. This one. This one. This one. Solidarity. Okay, great. So, so I just leave it like that. I don't have to put it big. Mm. Yes. Like Can that? everyone see it? Yes. Uh, do we have to put it in presentation? F1? Uh, presentation? You know that it's yes. I don't know in French how you call it. Parce que moi je suis normalement avec un Yes. Hello. <laughs> um, so, hello, I'm Firuse. I'm so excited. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm so excited to talk about my work here today in such wonderful company. Thank you to uh, uh, Corinne for the invitation. And I'm so happy also that we have so many activists and organizers 
uh, from different parts of the world and Latin America. But I really always see my work and hope my work is a conversation with activists and organizers, like the ones I work with too and collaborate with. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about my research on how solidarity is practiced in a technology-focused feminist co-op in Costa Rica and the implications of solidarity in resisting and negotiating techno-capitalist paradigms of development. This is the research that led to my book. So over the, I'm going to give first a little bit of context. Over the past 25 years, state and transnational institutions, the private sector, foundations, and non-governmental organizations have been in a race to include women and other marginalized communities in the digital society. The importance of integrating women as users, consumers, designers, and developers of technologies has become a global mantra against inequality. But this exciting future being constructed in which women are considered key figures full of potential contains in its fold subtle and not so subtle forms of violence. In my research, I ask the following questions. How does development discourse couple women in the global south and digital technologies as a frontier of expansion and inclusion and what forms of feminist technopolitics are flourishing in certain regions of the global south? What kinds of compromises and negotiations have been necessary? I examined these questions by studying two organizations that focus on gender and technology in the global south, the transnational network APC, the Women's Rights Program of APC, and the co-op Sulabatsu in Costa Rica, Central America as well as analyzing more than 200 reports, documents, and other publications from private foundations and technology corporations, from the United Nations and the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, from state entities supplemented by organizational literature. Today, I'm going to very briefly discuss my analysis of more of these reports, particularly from the United Nations, talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, on women and digital technologies, and focus on the work of the local development technology focus Co-op Sulawatsu. Founded in 2005, Sulawatsu follows a cooperative model where mostly women share the management and the income of the organization. The co-op has approximately 20 associates and a core working daily staff of about 10 people. One of Sulabatsu's main initiatives is to bring women and girls closer in Costa Rica and Central America mostly to digital technologies, digital literacy, literacy through associative technology-based entrepreneurship and supporting women in science and technology. They also do work in policy, research, and art. So drawing from these uh, ethnographic methods, I make two arguments. First, development discourse preys on care in producing what I have called an ideal third world technological woman who combines technological dexterity and entrepreneurial instinct with caring qualities such as self-sacrifice and nurturing without addressing the histories that have erected the very barriers that these women are supposed to miraculously overcome. Second, feminist digital activists who are involved in development work mobilize a politics of care rooted in solidarity and pleasure, but today I'm going to talk more about solidarity, although there is pleasure in solidarity, in negotiating and define techno-capitalist paradigms of digital inclusion. So very briefly, how is care mobilized in development discourses on digital technologies? Since I began analyzing development discourse in 2014, the sense of urgency to include women in the digital society has increased dramatically. UNESCO has literally described it as a race against time. 
Prominent strategies inclu include capacity building and training in digital in ICTs, ITCs, ICTs for entrepreneurship, education in science and technology, and a diverse array of plans to promote the entrance and retention of women in science and technology fields in education and the workforce. The trope of the nimble finger and the cheap docile, dexterous woman of the exporting processing sewn assembly pants produced by global capitalism in the 1980s and 1990s is also today the caring woman with the technological entrepreneurial mind. This excerpt from uh, one of the most influential reports in the past years, I'd blush if I could, from 2019, connects some of the interrelated dimensions of the third world technological woman. If you have digital skills, you will have financial inclusion, which will lead you to the capacity to live a full life. If women are incapable of learning digital skills, they will not be able to secure a livelihood, not even a partner. If digital finance does not unlock their potential, while managing and mitigating harms and barriers, equality is unlikely. Digitalization, which includes platform capitalism, thus becomes, and I quote Daniel Green, an information scholar, a symbol of economic progress, the promised land you'll reach with the right equipment and the right training. Um, in the texts under study, the ones I study, it is mostly women from the global south who will take you to that promised land. The burden of economic progress lies on the backs of gendered, racialized, and classed subjects. So in these moments of crisis, which will be more frequent and destructive, some vital questions are, what spaces are feminist organizations carving amid techno-capitalist development discourses and policies? What does a feminist technopolitics of care look like? This is what an indigenous woman from the Cabecar community of the Caribbean Alto Pacuare region of Costa Rica told Kemli Camacho, my friend and collaborator, the coordinator of Sulawatsu, during one of their conversations. The petition blew Kemli's mind away. After having worked on technology-related issues her whole life, and having founded the internationally recognized co-op more than 50 years, 15 years ago, Kemli could not wrap her head around the implications of collaborating on the creation of Una Tecnología del Sentir, a technology of feelings. Sulabatsu had mostly focused on entrepreneurship and training women to climb the corporate ladder of STEM. And this Tecnología del Sentir drastically differed from the profit-oriented neoliberal technologies and ideas of technology that Kemli had worked with her whole life. But I perceived this moment after reflecting upon it many months following my first visit to Costa Rica, my last visit to Costa Rica, well, not anymore, in 2019, as a culmination of Sulabatsu's work and organizational practices rooted in a feminist politics of solidarity. For the indigenous Cabecar and Bribri women, whose communities are under the imminent arrival of internet connection, the meanings of co-designing a technology of feelings were grounded in practical results, such as creating a virtual application that could submerge users in their communities and cosmology, or an application connected to sensors that can detect when deforestation trucks enter their lands. But their request surpassed the, the practical. A technology of feelings is about celebrating their knowledges and ways of being. It is about collaboration, joy, and respect. It is about following different rhythms not determined by linearity, assessments, outcomes, and results. And to be able to create a technology of feelings, we also had to feel them. Kemli told me. The indigenous women told the co-op activists that to be able to work together, they had to visit their communities, sleep in their houses, explore their lands, and participate in their ceremonies. And so they did. They crossed rivers and hiked mountains under incessant rain, 
flooding and paths of mud to fill the communities they were going to start a project with. This is one of their apps, it's online, I think still, uh, co-designed with Sulawatsu that introduces the community to their world. Uh, Okoma, Okamasway means white man's technology in Kabekar, and they use this as an act of defiance. As an example of this shift, Sulawatsu has recently started to collaborate in a project guided, designed, and directed by the Kabekar woman to create an internet community network in their lands with the goal of achieving digital sovereignty, uh, talking about that term. Funding was already secured, materials had been bought, they were about to start the construction of the internet community network. But the Quebecar women decided that an internet network suddenly would not work in their vast territory, where sometimes they have to walk for hours to see another person. So Sulabatsu changed course. Uh, but their, the network, they, they, they couldn't believe it at first, right? What do you mean you don't want, uh, uh, you don't want in, in internet anymore? And the indigenous se women said, we want a walkie talkies. So they asked instead for walkie talkies to be able to communicate across long distances. This network of walkie talkies defies corporate and state agendas of digital inclusion and offers a terrain, both literal and metaphorical, of indigenous assertion and refusal. When care is centered, technology is decentered. Sulabasu's objective combines multiple knowledges, and that is also intersectional. The technical and what is considered non-technical. And this point is crucial. The capacity to center relationships, combine different knowledges, change objectives and ways of doing are all part of a feminist technopolitics of care. The co-op has slowly undergone a transformation, distancing themselves from mere inclusion in the digital society while moving towards critique and constant contestation. Another one of their projects focused on digital security training, um, for which they also had funding, for women who work at the pineapple cultivations in the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica, provides additional insights into the dilemma of focusing on digital inclusion as a solution to social problems. Las Defensoras, the defenders against the pineapple corporations in Costa Rica, both center and decenter the technological in their body territory activism. This project focused on conducting research on the digital vulnerabilities of women environmental leaders at the Piñeras, the pineapple producing corporations. This is a highly destructive monoculture in Costa Rica. Pineapple cultivation has exhausted the land, undermining the possibilities of other forms of agriculture, privatized lands in the hands of multinational corporations, contaminated surrounding bodies of water, and exploited the workers. Elena, one of the co-op's activists who led the initiative, explained that although funding from the University of Toronto, actually, focused on digital t security training, the co-op immediately realized through their conversations with these defensoras that their priorities were the defense of their lands as well as their bodies. For example, they were more worried about walking home alone and how violence in their homes was connected to violence in the workplace than about being able to secure their communication via signal or telegram. So the co-op changed course again. Sulawatsu did conduct digital training sessions on privacy and data protection and co-designed a manual on digital security, but it was clear through their participatory methodologies with the community that these women's struggles were part of a much broader landscape of violence. But it is impossible to understand Sulawatsu, and I think this is why my talk is called Solidarity as Practice. And I think this is what is very truly part of a feminist technopolitics or of a feminist politics or of a social economia solidaria. It's impossible to understand Sulawatsu's work without understanding their relationships, their bonds, income and knowledge collectivization, 
horizontality are deeply connected with their work on technology. They enact a form of prefigurative politics, which means that they practice the world they envision. Their office in Barrio Escalante is organized as an open space full of natural light where everyone can look at each other. Every day at 3 p.m., we had coffee together, an almost sacred daily bonding ritual. They work, talk, and laugh, and also move through conflicts regarding differences in approaches, styles, and objectives. They have arguments on issues that range from funding sources to religion and sexuality. Their most treasured goal is to sustain relationships of care among themselves and with the communities they work with. There was and continues to be an emphasis on joy, dreaming the impossible, and returning, returning to the drawing board however many times necessary. This is also una tecnología del sentir, a technology of feelings. They make space to start over, reflect, and regret. They make time for long conversations on work-related and personal problems. None of this means that the work or what we consider work is not being done. The key is to understand who defines what work looks like. They work when loving, caring for each other, and sharing coffee with natilla, guava jam, and fresh bread every day. They work when they talk about their lives, heartbreaks, mistakes, and regrets. They work during those long conversations in the van traveling around Costa Rica while Juan drives from north to south, from the Caribbean to the Pacific coast and back. They are also working when they interrupt everything to help a coworker who is depressed. This is all part of the everyday labor and feminist technopolitics at La Cope. The, these are pictures of La, La Cope in San Jose. The most important work of La Cope lies in its micropolitics, in how they weave relationships in each space in which they move with the technologies that they design, think, and imagine, with a politics of solidarity and hope in building the world they dream of. In other words, the revolution is in how they do what they do. In her quest to disengage from modern colonial epistemologies and ways of producing knowledge, Leanne Simpson says that first she did not truly appreciate how the Nishnambeg, her own community in Canada, produced theory through practice. And it was priceless, precisely, this is her quote, which I love very much, um, it was precisely Sula Batsu's how that alerted me to the meanings of a feminist technopolitics of care a technopolitics that is life-affirming and world-making. A politics of solidarity, right, we cannot romanticize, is not without conflict, heartbreaks, and negotiation. Relationships are also ridden with difficulties, which affect how they do what they do. The co-op is not perfect, and their story is not a fairy tale. They have confronted internal fissures, conflicts, and irreconcilable differences, and their relationships are constantly being negotiated. People have left La Cope for numerous reasons. New job opportunities, changes in personal circumstances, or because they are moving to another country. But there have also been bitter disagreements on the co-op's mission, structure, and procedures personal conflicts among activists, a lack of understanding of how a co-op works, and because, and we talked a lot about this yesterday, I know Aline and other uh, activists, and uh, because of the very real need of earning a higher and more secure income than the co-op can provide. Often these departures have been interpreted as betrayals, ending what had been close friendships. Every time someone has left La Cope, it has implied an effective rupture. Kemli explained to me, cycles of financial turmoil have caused many people to leave the co-op. 
In addition to producing tremendous emotional upheaval among the activists, these partings temporarily destabilized the flow of the organization. One of the major challenges of Sulawatsu, since its foundation as many organizations, grassroots organizations, has been to attain financial sustainability, the same stability they work to promote in the communities they serve. The balance between maintaining the joint worker management control of the organization with streams of individual income being distributed among the collective has been very challenging. Like many other grassroots organizations, Sulabatsu constantly has to balance their solidarity-centered model on collectivization and social justice with the material conditions they need to be able to do their work. Solidarity is always brimming with conflict and negotiation. And I just want to briefly say that funding, the topic of funding is always very complicated. Yeah, at least me as an ethnographer is one of the most complicated uh, issues uh, when I am working and collaborating with grassroots feminist organizations. So one of the most challenging moments in, uh, for Sulawatsu is when they accepted funding from Google for one of their feminist projects on technology in Central America. This caused conflicts with fellow feminist activists, but the co-op has defended their autonomy. It is extremely important that we scrutinize the funding structures of grassroots organizations and co-ops. At the same time, we must not simply discard liberatory efforts without looking at internal forms of resistance, appropriation, refusal, and negotiation. And this is something, a uh, quote from Kemley, right, uh, that she talks about funding. Funding is always, um, can be always problematic. It doesn't matter where it comes from. So, uh, Sulawatsu is an organization that works both within paradigms of inclusion and also against and beyond. So they do work on many scales, right? Um, and the critique of inclusion and digital inclusion in particularly is very tricky. It is, after all, what Gayatri Spivak says, what one cannot not want. Inclusion has its benefits. Being included can have and has had fruitful and positive results. Feminist activists work within, against, and beyond various forms of inclusion. But the right to refusal is indeed fundamental, as many black, brown, and indigenous scholars and activists have contended. So is understanding that technologies will not solve complex social problems, thus the walkie-talkies, that which is a technology, but not the one they expected. In Latin America, we talk a lot about appropriation, and I think much less about the right to refuse. I do believe that practicing solidarity is a form of refusal. And when there is refusal, there is also creation as Leanne Simpson calls it, generative refusals. And Mexican activist and thinker Gustavo Esteva says that a politics of no affirms many yeses. But I am not suggesting refusal or any form of contestation in particular. I don't think that's my place. These strategies should come and have come from the activists and the community themselves. What I am suggesting is that we remain attentive to the politics of inclusion in the current systems we are living within. We are surrounded by policies, practices, and discourses that capture dreams and hopes of inclusion while being simultaneously invested in extraction and dispossession. And who are the ones to be included? Those who have been historically excluded as part of what Sara Ahmed calls a technology of governance that brings in those who have been recognized as strangers, but also of making strangers into subjects. So amid endless social, economic, and ecological crisis, we must continue to interrogate the goals and the consequences of inclusion in systems that are pers persistently unjust and racist, misogynistic, transphobic, classist, and ableist. Systems that include while simultaneously dispossessing, extracting, and exploiting. 
We should continue to be attentive to the imaginaries being mobilized and weaponized to lure people to want to be included and what forms of inclusion those are. Digitalization is one of many realms that depend on inclusion. Inclusion of bodies, workers, land, infrastructure, data, consumers, users, designers, expertise, creativity, care, relationships, and intimacies. A wealth of people around the world are reinventing the digital society, like Sulabatsu, like co-ops, co design justice nodes, to feminist, queer, climate justice, anti-racist, indigenous, and abolitionist grassroots organizations and coalitions, unions fighting for decent wages and working conditions, movements for better healthcare, housing, and education, and community-based webs of mutual aid. Solidarity is already intrinsic to many of these projects. These may not be perfect, nor are they supposed to be. Yet I do believe that this is where the most thrilling visions and practices for social justice are unfolding. Thank you. <laughs>